Hi friends, good morning. I'm gonna pull this out. Um, it's, it's so good to be with you all for um, our third week of Credo. I, uh, I think I have met most of you, but if we have not met, I'm Sarah Speed, one of the new pastors. Um, I told Werner a couple weeks ago when he kicked off, um, having never experienced Credo, I was like, Werner, thank God you're going first. <laughs> And now that I have to follow Werner and Scott, I'm like, I wish I had gone first. But here we are. I'm so glad you all are here. I think what we're talking about today really matters. So thanks for taking the time. I did want to say before we kick off, please keep eating and drinking. I think they've brought out some more treats. So if you're hungry or if you need a refresher, do that. Feel free to run to the bathroom if you need to. And if you need to leave early, I know a couple people have tickets to fun things after. Just know that this will be recorded for you all and my parents and will be on YouTube <laughs> tomorrow. So it's on our channel. So if you have to miss the end and you're like, I just really need to know about Pelagianism, we have you taken care of. Um, so that's that. I want to get us started. Um, a show of hands, how many of you have heard of Pelagianism? Oh my gosh, that's, that's where I was about a month ago. Um, I don't know that this is something we talk about. It's definitely not something we spend a lot of time in seminary on, and yet it has been formative for our faith, so we're diving in. Pelagianism um, denies the doctrine of original sin um, and loves um, perfectionism. So as we think about that, um, another show of hands, how many of you really love efficiency? Oh, yeah, you all are my people. Okay, hands down. How many of you as students were, really wanted to get the A? Mm-hmm, yeah, okay. How many of you think there is a correct way to load the dishwasher? Yeah, okay, also my people. Um, how many of you love to check off a to-do list? Yes, okay. So, our society loves perfection. We love perfection, and we love the idea that if you wake up an hour earlier or eat Whole30 or stay an hour later at the office or get the A's, that you can make your life better for yourself and you can move closer to perfection. Our society loves that idea. Pelagius, Pelagius loved that idea. Our faith has another message. So I'm going to kick us off with a quick story and then we'll dive in. But my, I was definitely someone who had some perfectionist tendencies growing up. Um, and I remember when I was in college, um, I was a mm, senior in college, um, I got my heart broken by my college sweetheart. And anyone who has ever known grief, anyone who has ever lost a pet or had a breakup or had a hard goodbye or, I don't know, lived through a pandemic, knows that when we grieve, it's... It's hard to focus, right? It's hard to think clearly. And I was this competitive, wanted to get the A student. I wanted the perfect score. And I can remember calling my mom as a senior in college, close to tears, and saying to her, Mom, I'm just too sad to read. Like, I'm going to get C's this semester. I'm going to fail. And what my mom said to me on the phone that day is she said, Sarah, your dad and I, do not need you to be perfect. We want you to try hard, and we want you to take care of yourself. And that's what really matters. Friends, Pelagianism, Pelagianism wants us to strive for perfection. Our faith has another message, and we're going to talk through that today. So, where's this clicker? Wow, I've never used a clicker. I'm excited. This feels really powerful. So this is our roadmap. So um, today I'm going to remind us what a heresy is. We're going to talk about who Pelagius was. We're going to talk about how the controversy began. And then we're going to flush through what Pelagius believed. His, his counter argument came from Augustine. So Pelagius and Augustine butted heads. They disagreed. They debated. So we're going to look at both sides of their argument. And then we're going to close with what do we do with this? How does it affect us moving forward? So that's our roadmap. So, just as a reminder, for those of you who haven't been here the last two weeks, a heresy is a theological statement, belief, or doctrine that has been rejected by the church. I really like the way Scott talked about this last week. He talked about how heresy comes from the word choice. And so for the early church, they were diving into and debating what was the right choice in our theology. 
We kind of treat heresy now like a dirty word, like, ooh, you're a heretic. But these folks a long time ago were actually deeply faithful, asking faithful questions. They were coming from a good place. So that's a heresy. And this is the star of our show today, Pelagius. Doesn't he look happy? <laughs> yeah. Pelagius' full name was Jerome Pelagius, although history um, has forgotten his first name almost enter entirely. I don't know. It's like sports. He only goes by his last name. So everything refers to him as Pelagius. Pelagius was a British monk who taught for a short time in Rome at the end of the fourth century. Due to political conflict, it's believed that he moved from Rome to North Africa, and it was in North Africa that Pelagius got in a debate with Augustine, also called Saint Augustine, who was the famous Bishop of Hippo. What's interesting is very little is known about Pelagius before his debate with Augustine. Um, we know that he was a writer because we have some of his writings. So we know and assume that he was well educated. He was well, um, he was very articulate. Um, most of his writings had to do with the Pauline epistles as well as ethics and religious piety. Um, so there's a strand, it seems, of Pelagius, which checks out with this heresy, really loved to focus on righteous living. But we don't know a lot about him before this debate, and we don't know a lot about him after the debate. So that means Pelagius is really a one-hit wonder. He shows up in our life of faith. He brings a very good question and debate about original sin, and then he exits. And so this is, this is the glimpse that we get of him, um, and I'm grateful for that glimpse. I wish we knew more, but I'm grateful for that glimpse. So this is the guy, good old Jerome, that our heresy is named after. Um, and, and this is how it started. So Pelagius was in church in North Africa. It's assumed that Augustine was leading, and Augustine said a prayer. And this is what got the ball rolling. So I want you all to say this out loud with me, what's in quotations. Are we ready? Grant what you command and command what you desire. This is what Pelagius heard in church uh, with Augustine, and it didn't sit well with him. Now, interestingly enough, this prayer probably sounds like things you've heard here at Fifth. For example, grant what you command, that might also be translated to help us to do what you ask. Give us strength. Open our eyes. These are things that we say in worship all the time. And then this command what you desire. To me, I interpret that as Augustine saying to God, like, don't hold your punches. Go big. Dream big for us. Tell us how it should be. Don't stop asking of us as people of faith. This is what Augustine says. Grant what you command and command what you desire. And Pelagius, I wouldn't say throws a hissy fit because that's not really in the text, but he does not, he does not like this prayer. And so they begin this debate. This is what Pelagius didn't like. Pelagius did not like that Augustine was implying in his prayer that we as people needed God's help to do the thing that God asked. So when Augustine said, God, grant what you command, Pelagius heard that, rightfully, as Augustine saying, God, we need your help to get to where you want us to be. Pelagius didn't like that because he believed that if there was moral responsibility from God, then there must be ability on our end to follow through with that. Does that make sense? Pelagius believed it's not fair. He felt like it was an unfair act for God to ask something of us that we as humans could not follow up on. Now, he walked this out as far as to say that if God gave us the Ten Commandments, then it must be possible for us to always abide by the Ten Commandments and to never do wrong by any of those. For Pelagius, he believed 
that if God believed, that if God was giving us this request, then surely we could live into that perfection. Now, what this means is that Pelagius believed that if humans tried hard enough, if we just tried hard enough, if we woke up the extra hour, if we ate Whole30, if we did all of the things, that we could become perfect, we could become sinless. And how did he think that we did this? Pelagius thought that in order for us to, to reach heaven, that it depended on our free will. What's not on grace, but on free will. Pelagius believed that we each had options and that if we chose wisely, if we made the right decision, then we could become perfect. The way that he really emphasized this was through righteous living and spiritual practices. So Pelagius would encourage Christians to um, build a life for themselves that did not surround themselves with temptation. And he was really adamant about Christians needed to be in scripture, they needed to be praying regularly, they needed to be in a community of faith so that every possible opportunity they could be strengthened to make the right decision. Does that make sense? All right, so what, this is when we talk together, <clears throat> what is good about this view from Pelagius? We're gonna do pros and cons. So first, what is good about this view that if we strive, if we try hard, if we surround ourselves with this righteous life that, that we might be able to, to become without sin, what is good about that? Any thoughts? Yes. So there's some control. Who among us likes control? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, we love that idea, right? Like, it's up to us. We're responsible for ourselves. We could get ourselves into heaven. That's a very appealing idea for many. What else is good about this view? Yeah. It encourages moral behavior. Yes, ding, ding, ding. Yes, Pelagius loved this. This view encourages moral behavior. Pelagius thought, um, if it's up to us, then by golly, we're probably going to see more people in the pews on Sunday, and we're probably going to see more people be kind because it's up to us. It's not up to grace. Yeah, any other good things you all can think of? Those are two really great answers. Yeah, there might be some internal peace that comes with leading a good life. Absolutely, that's beautiful, Maureen. I think there's, yeah. And maybe the thing that I got out of that is that if you had a group of people that were trying to do the same thing, you would have more support. Yes, so it also could be this communal opportunity, absolutely, of like we need each other to live this righteous life, and that strengthens the church, that strengthens community. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's a lot that's appealing about this view, right? We get it. I, I think it makes sense why this, this gained some traction. At a bare minimum, I think there's a hope in this view that's really appealing because Pelagius so adamantly believed in us and in our ability to do good, and he also believed that God believed in us. Because he thought God would never ask something of us that we couldn't do. And so surely God is team us and we are capable of doing this good work. So there was a hope that was really appealing. All right, now, what's challenging about this view? Yes. It doesn't work. It doesn't work, yes. <laughs> that is what Augustine also said. Yeah, so why doesn't it work? Right, yeah. So we can try as hard as we might, and then one day we get hangry, and there it goes. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. It's, it's hard. It doesn't work to try and be perfect. What else is challenging about this view? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Okay, so if 
um, so the comment that was, by trying to live this way, we might remove ourselves from the messiness of the world in order to preserve our own self to make sure that we ourselves can reach salvation, which is not exactly what Jesus did, right? Like Jesus went into the mess. Jesus went head first into the mess. And so if we are trying to avoid the mess, then that's how we could become bubbled in our own little safe space of no temptation, no sin, no messiness. Anything else that strikes you all? Yeah. It's assuming that we don't need God. Yes, absolutely. If we can reach perfection in our, and salvation on our own, do we need God? What happens to God? What is, what is God's role in that? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It also, on the flip side, implies that we are a whole lot closer to divinity than we might think, right? I mean, part of, if, if we can reach perfection, then what really separates us from Jesus? And that's a pretty big assumption, is that like we can get there on our own. It's just up to free will. We can get there on our own. Yeah, so this is what's challenging. So there are good things that come with this view, and there are also some really challenging, concerning things that come with this view. So, as they do, Pelagius and Augustine <laughs> debate. I did not make this image. It was found on the internet, which is just... The internet's an amazing place sometimes. <laughs> so Pelagius and Augustine debate, and they have um, two main disagreements. The first is around sin and grace, which deals with this um, doctrine of original sin. And the second is around what's more important with a good deed, the act or a motivation. These are kind of two legs that the, the stool stands on that they just disagree on. And so I want to talk through, um, I want to talk through both of these. So first things first, sin and grace. Pelagius, as we have discussed, believes that humans can reach perfection. Augustine gets this letter and disagrees. He says, Humans cannot reach perfection, as was said earlier. It's not possible. We can't. I, do you know a single human that has made perfection? No. We cannot reach perfection. Instead, Augustine argues, we depend on God's grace. We need God's grace. To that, Pelagius says, mm, it's not grace that we need. We don't need grace. We need, salvation is up to free will. Pelagius, again, believed that God had given us free will, God had given us freedom, and that was this great gift from God that we, he felt empowered for us to use wisely to make sure that we were making good decisions. So Pelagius says, we don't need grace. We need to make good decisions. We need to lean on our free will. Augustine says, wrong again. <laughs> we do need grace because humans are inherently sinful. If it's up to free will, we're never going to get there. We need grace because we're sinful. So to summarize, Pelagius is arguing, salvation is up to us. We can get there on our own if we try hard enough. Augustine says, salvation is up to God. So this red part, we do need grace because humans are sinful, this is really the breakdown point. This is really where the conversation comes to, um, comes to a head. Augustine believed that humans had free will, um, but Augustine also believed that humans are sinful. So here's what's interesting. Pelagius argued that humans were born morally neutral. Augustine, or Pelagius said, you're not born good, you're not born bad, you're a blank slate. And from then on out, the decisions that you make paint your path. Augustine said, we are created good. That's how Genesis starts. We're, we're created good. It says we're good, good, good in the beginning. That's the beginning of the story. We're created good, but also we're sinful. It's not a moral neutral. It's we're good and we're a mess, right? It's both. So this is what pushes the two of them to really dig into what we call the doctrine of original sin. Bet you didn't know you were coming to hear about this today. <laughs> we as Presbyterians do not love talking about sin. It makes us nervous. Um, we really like grace. It's emphasized all over the prayer of confession. If you listen to it, it's like 
Before we pray, we tell you, don't worry, God's got you. And then we pray, and then we also end with, don't worry, God's still got you. Like, we love grace. So Presbyterians don't love talking about sin, but we can't talk about Pelagianism without talking about sin. So I'm going to spend just a couple minutes talking about this doctrine, and we will take it back to the heresy. Stick with me. So, the doctrine's origin. Where did this conversation about original sin come from? It came from three places. At the time of Pelagius and Augustine's argument, debate, there was already talk in the water about sin in the early church. The early church was already talking about sin. And they were talking about it because it's in scripture. So the, the church, early church was looking at Adam and Eve and they were looking at the letters of Paul, which were talking about sin, and they were trying to figure out, okay, what do we believe? What do we believe about all of this? What does this mean for us? So Pelagius and Augustine bring this, this to the table, and it's really this debate that helps Augustine refine his views, and Augustine is kind of the forefather of um, the doctrine of original sin. So the doctrine of original sin says this. Humans are inherently sinful. We cannot escape sin from our own power. What the doctrine does not say is that we should throw in the towel. That is not what the doctrine of original sin is saying. Reinhold Niebuhr says it as this. Sin is inevitable but not necessary. I don't know why the quotation marks are in the middle. I think that whole thing is supposed to be quotation marks, so just <laughs> ignore that. Niebuhr says sin is inevitable, but it's not necessary. This is that fine line of saying we are inherently sinful, and also it doesn't mean we give up. It doesn't mean we say, oh, well, I'm just going to do whatever I want. It's inevitable, but it's not necessary. So a good place to look, uh, part of what I want to say about the doctrine of original sin, if you leave here and you Google the doctrine of original sin, you're going to get a whole lot and you might come back to me and be like, okay, I have more questions. So I want to let you know that the doctrine has evolved since Augustine's time in a really healthy and beautiful way, as does our faith always, right? Like we are reformed and always reforming. We are always evolving. So the original, when Augustine was arguing with Pelagius, I'm going to use Adam and Eve as an example. This is what he was saying at that time. Augustine was saying Adam and Eve are the origin story of sin. So Augustine looked at scripture, looked at Adam and Eve, and said, this is where it comes from, this is why we're sinful. Augustine even went as far as to say, like, we get sin in our DNA from Adam, passed down all these years. Like, he thought it was biologically in us. Modern Christians would not say that. Instead, they would say, Adam and Eve are an example of human sin. Today, we would look at that same story and say, this is an example of how we love God and we can strive to be good and we will still make a mess of it sometimes and then we will continue trying to love God, right? This is an example. So the doctrine has evolved. And I love this quote from Daniel Migliori who, who points to this. He says, the biblical stories of the Garden of Eden and the fall of humanity are imaginative portrayals of the goodness of creation, there it is, like we start good even though we're sinful, and the universality of sin, rather than a historical count of sin's origin. So, now that we all know about the doctrine of original sin, um, I wanna get back to our heresy. So Augustine and Pelagius don't agree that humans are inherently sinful. They cannot see eye to eye on this. And I'm gonna use this example of Adam and Eve again. Pelagius denies the doctrine of original sin. So instead of looking at Adam and Eve as a, a case study of how humans are sinful, he says, no, 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 this is just an example of people who made a bad choice. This is an example of why we should try to make good choices, to use our free will, to strive for perfection. He says, they're not, this is not all humans. This is just an example of how it goes bad. And Augustine says, this is all of us. Adam and Eve are all of us. Like, we all, we all make a mess. This is all of us. So they don't reconcile that. And this is a, this is a breakdown. Um, 
Pelagius says we do not need grace, we need strong will. Augustine says we do need grace, there is no other way. They can't see eye to eye on this doctrine of original sin, which means they can't see eye to eye on the need for grace. Because Augustine says we are sinful, it demands God's grace. Salvation is up to God's grace. We are saved by grace. And Pelagius says no. So that's the first thing that they disagree on. The second one's shorter. Are we good? Are we we're here? Yeah, we're tracking. Great. Um, this is the second thing that they disagree on. Whether or not um, the act of a good deed is more important or the motivation of a good deed is more important. So Augustine and Pelagius, they're, they're debating. Um, and and for, for Pelagius, if, if salvation is all about not sinning, then good deeds become a checklist to check off to get into heaven. And it's about doing the good thing. It's not about the motivation for the good thing. Because suddenly, you might be holding the door for someone who needs the door open, not because you care about your neighbor, but because you don't want to burn in hell, right? Like, that becomes the motivation. And Augustine says, I'm not okay with that. And Pelagius says, well, if it's a good deed, it's a good deed. It doesn't matter if I'm doing it for myself or if I'm doing it for my neighbor. If it's a good deed, it's a good deed. Augustine thinks that is too shallow. Probably, I think. I think Augustine thought that was too shallow and that that is not what our faith calls us to. Instead, Augustine looks at scripture and he says everything that Jesus does is about a life of transformation, right? It's not just do the good deed so you end up in heaven. It's not be kind to your neighbor. It's love your neighbor as yourself. That's transformation, it's not forgive once because that's a checklist to get into heaven. It's forgive 70 times 7. That's transformation. It's not try not to hold a grudge this one time. It's turn the other cheek. That's transformation. Augustine is saying it's not just about doing the good deed. It's about the motivation behind it. And we as people of faith are striving to be transformed. So that we're not just doing good deeds to get into heaven, but we're doing good deeds because that is what God asks of us, and that's this kingdom come, thy will be done world we strive to build for ourselves and to live in. So Augustine and Pelagius debate this, and, and Augustine really argues that, um, that the motivation matters. We're seeking transformation, and we depend on God's grace to get transformed. This is how it all ties up. So, where does the church land? They're going in circles. They're arguing. Where does the church land? It's a bad day for Pelagius, <clears throat> so you guys can see. He does get excommunicated. The, their, their debate about sin and grace and why we do good deeds goes before the councils in 416 and again in 418. And, and this debate is labeled Pelagianism, the idea that we don't need God's grace, that we can get there on our own. Pelagius is excommunicated. He moves to Palestine. We don't hear anything else about him. We do know that he has a couple of followers who keep teaching this idea, but eventually um, the church moves in favor of Augustine's doctrine, which says we absolutely need grace and we are striving for a life of transformation. So I think this gives us, I want to end with a couple of takeaways of what do we do now? Whenever, whenever I do Bible study, I love to ask three questions. What's happening in the text? So what? Which is why does it matter? And now what? What do we do about it? What, so what, now what? We're following the same trajectory. <laughs> so this is our now what. Like, okay, we've learned about Pelagius, we've learned about Augustine, now what do we do with it? And these, these few takeaways come from both of them. Pelagius, um, I think Nancy, as you said, was terrified that we would get lazy if we knew that we had grace. Pelagius was worried that if, if we tell Christians you are saved by grace, that they would say, sweet, I'm not going to church, right? Like, I'm just going to sleep in. I don't need anything. Pelagius was really worried that we would just give up on righteous living. And so I think from this, from this debate, we can honor Pelagius and say, 
We want to we want to do the work. We want to do the work. We want to recognize that we're saved by grace, and we also want to do the work. So one thing we can take away from this is that our faith does not invite us to just skate through life. It involves rolling up our sleeves. It involves getting messy. It involves doing the work of the church. Another takeaway, I think, and this is really from Augustine, is to know who we are, is to trust who we are. We are human, which means we will sin from time to time. I've never met a perfect person. But we also are loved by God and saved by grace. I mean, the creation story, Adam and Eve, starts good. That's the same for us. So we can know who we are, and that honors Augustine's side of this debate, which is that we are saved by grace. We are held in God's love, and that does not change no matter how many times we sin. That always, that's our therefore, that's our point today. We are loved by God, no if, no but, just a therefore. Oh, oh yeah, okay, and this is why this is important. I forgot I had this in here. <laughs> Surprise! Um, so, I read recently in the New York Times that, that younger generations are reporting higher levels of perfectionism than any generation before. Um, and it is significantly impacting their negative health or their mental health negatively. So um, Harvard Business did a study that included 41,641 American, Canadian, and British college students between 1989 and 2016. And they tested um, how students were dealing with, were registering perfectionist tendencies in a couple different areas, social, academic, and hmm, there's another one, self-oriented, so I don't know, maybe that's your own internal conversation. But what they found is that through time, our teenagers, our young adults today, are significantly more critical on themselves than generations were before. And the measure of perfection, the measure of I've gotta be this good, I've gotta be this good, keeps going up. And so, as I said at the very beginning, this story about calling my mom, feeling the need to be perfect, that is in the waters of our world right now. And it is getting harder and harder for our young people who are on social media and getting these messages constantly about what it means to be successful, and they can't keep up. Nobody can keep up with that. And so, our world has this a little bit of this Pelagianism march of just try harder, keep trying, you can be perfect. And our faith has an entirely different message, which says, we want you to try, but also you're loved full stop, right? Like, no matter if you get the A or not, God will still view you as good. And so I think one of the gifts, one of the reasons this is important, this debate is important, is that we as a church can preach a different message of like, come on in, <laughs> No matter where you are on your journey of life, love, or faith, you're welcomed here. And that feels really important. So this is just one example. I'm sure you all could think of many other reasons why this is relevant and um, important, but that's an example. The last now what is that I think this studying this heresy that I had never heard about um, has inspired me to remember that this life of faith is about being transformed. It is not just checking off the box of doing good or showing up. It is about internally being transformed. And when we are able to acknowledge that we are sinful and that we are saved by grace, then we're able to be honest about the work of transformation that needs to occur in us. And we open up the door for God to work in our lives. And that is amazing.